Figuring out which solar panel option is the best candidate for your solar project is one of the most difficult tasks that homeowners face in the process of shopping for solar. Let's say you do a Google search for the best solar panels and we're usually inundated with a ton of information. And oftentimes actually these solar panel companies pay huge commissions to review websites in order to get their name on the top solar panel lists. The information on these aggregator websites can therefore be a little bit biased and flat out incorrect. Picking the right solar panel for your home from the very beginning is so important. And if you can just follow along Along for the next 10 minutes, you'll learn how to evaluate the quality of a solar panel yourself and determine which one might be the best fit for your project. And make sure you stick around until the end because I'll be covering a massive overarching issue that's affecting all residential solar customers in 2025, something almost nobody is talking about and how you can protect yourself from it. So the first thing that beginner homeowners tend to look at when presented with options for various solar panels is the panel's wattage. And I cannot advise against this enough. In fact, I'll be the first to say that just because a panel has a higher wattage does not make it a better solar panel by any means. Wattage simply refers to the overall module power. And since most solar panels nowadays hover around the same module efficiency, increasing the total power of a solar panel often just means the manufacturer makes a physically larger solar panel. Most residential solar panels that you'll find will be between 370 and 420 watts. And the reason is because most solar contractors have determined that this size strikes a good balance of being moderately sized without becoming so large to the point where it's difficult to design on small roof areas. This is why in large commercial and utility scale projects, you'll find 500 to 600 watt panels. They're not necessarily better panels. They're just larger panels, which are being used because they don't face the same design constraints that rooftop installations have. If somebody tells you that their solar panel is better than a competitor's because it has a higher wattage, that's simply not true. And it's probably just a bigger panel. Lastly, homeowners and contractors typically purchase panels on a price per watt basis. So you won't necessarily save money by purchasing fewer of a higher watt panel for your installation. That's just not how it works. Now, there is one way a solar panel manufacturer can increase the wattage of a solar panel without making it larger, and that is by engineering a higher efficiency solar panel. For the last 20 years, one of the biggest challenges that solar panel engineers have faced is figuring out how to make solar panels more efficient. Solar panel efficiency simply refers to the percentage of sunlight or radiance that a solar panel can convert into usable electricity. 20 years ago, the average median module efficiency of a solar panel was just 13.5%. By 2024, that number has increased to just over 20%. To illustrate what efficiency efficiency looks like, imagine a solar panel that's one square meter in size and positioned toward the sun, which provides 1000 watts per square meter of irradiance. While the solar cells themselves might have an efficiency of up to 28%, that's not the only factor at play. You see, separating the solar cells are thin strips of metal referred to as bus bars, which connect the solar cells in the panel and then carry the direct current electricity that the solar cells are producing to the inverter. Since the areas covered by the bus bars do not produce electricity, the overall module efficiency in the this example is reduced to just 21%. This means in this example, the panel under these conditions would produce 210 watts of electrical output. Now you might be thinking, well, I looked at a couple of different solar panels and they all hover between 19 and 23% efficiency. And that's just not that big of a difference, but it is to achieve the same nominal output power with a 19% efficient solar panel as a 23% efficient system, you would need just over 20% more overall square footage of solar panels. So for homeowners with limited roof space, having an efficient solar panel system can be very beneficial. You can generally find the module efficiency of various solar panel options on their spec sheets. Super high efficiency panels will likely advertise this rating on the front page of their spec sheet, whereas lower efficiency panels, those with sub 20% efficiency, might have that rating buried somewhere on the second page of their spec sheet. Now, on the topic of efficiency and how that affects the panel's wattage, I want to address something which many homeowners get confused about, and that is how the wattage of their solar panel differs from the estimated kilowatt hour production of that panel and how solar panel manufacturers kind of partake in misleading advertising when marketing their panels. You see, when solar panels are tested for wattage in the factory, the wattage which they'd advertise the panel to be, they're subjected to what are called standard testing conditions, so STC. This means the panel is placed in a room at a temperature of 77 degrees Fahrenheit, and a large bowl with an irradiance of 1,000 watts per square meter is used to test for wattage. While this might sound like a fair approach, it's actually a bit of a naive way to do it because conditions like this in real life are rarely replicated. To address this, some manufacturers also test their panels under adverse operating conditions, also called NMOT. Under NMOT, panels are tested in a room at a temperature of 
113 degrees Fahrenheit with a radius of only 800 watts per square meter. These conditions provide a much better idea of how the panel will actually perform in real world scenarios because by looking at a panel with an NMOT rating, you can really get a more accurate sense of its true performance, especially in the less than ideal environments, making it a very important factor to consider when judging various solar panels. You see, solar panels operate at their maximum performance when outside temperatures are 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. And for every degree above that, their efficiency decreases slightly. And so to measure how well various solar panels perform in higher temperature conditions, we look at the panel's temperature coefficient rating. This rating indicates how much a panel's power output decreases for every one degree Celsius above 25 degrees Celsius. And it's typically expressed as a negative percentage per degree Celsius. And most panels fall between about negative 0.24% and negative 0.4%. This rating, the temperature coefficient, comes out to be one of the most important ratings to consider when evaluating solar panel options especially for homeowners in hotter climates like Florida, Texas, or Southern California. Because during summer months when panels are producing at their highest levels, outside temperatures may be around 80 to 90 degrees, but rooftop temperatures can soar upwards of 140 degrees Fahrenheit. This significantly impacts the panel's performance, making temperature coefficient a critical consideration if you want a system that's maximized to perform well in hot temperatures. Moving on from speaking about efficiency and temperature coefficient, I want to talk to you guys about warranties. Warranties are an extremely important factor in your solar investment. And when you purchase a solar panel system with your panel, you will often have two warranties, product warranty and a linear power warranty. Product warranties are fairly standard across the industry and they provide protections against manufactured defects and often last for a period of 12 to 25 years. More importantly, one of the best indicators of a high quality solar panel is its linear power warranty. This warranty specifies the maximum degradation that you can expect over 25 years, ensuring your panels will continue to perform at a reliable level throughout their life span. Like all electrical equipment, solar panels degrade over time. Typically, this degradation falls between 8 and 20% over 25 years, just depending upon the panel's quality. You'll find this rating on a solar panel spec sheet under the linear power warranty section or guaranteed power in year 25 section. For example, if a panel guarantees to retain 90% of its original power after 25 years, it has a total degradation rate of 10% over that period. Among all the factors to consider when choosing a solar panel, this is arguably the most important because it directly impacts the total energy that your system will produce over its lifetime. I mean, after all, the main reason that we invest into solar panels is to generate as much electricity as possible over time. And here's something that surprises a lot of people. Solar panels don't just last 25 years. They can actually keep working for upwards of 50 or 60 years. And the issue at that point isn't that they suddenly stop working. It's that at a certain point, their power output just drops to a certain point where it actually makes sense to replace them with newer technology. But just to illustrate how important degradation is, let me break it down for you guys into an illustration. Imagine I design two identical solar panel systems for you. Both use 25 400 watt panels and both produce 10,000 kilowatt hours in the first year. The only difference, solar system A uses panels with a guaranteed power of 84% at year 25, while system B uses panels with a guaranteed power of 92% at year 25. This means system A has an annual degradation rate of 0.694%, while system B has a much lower rate of 0.332%. Now, the difference might seem small and may even look insignificant to you, but let's zoom out and compare how these two systems will perform over time. I crunched the numbers and by year 25, system A will have generated roughly 236,800 kilowatt hours, while system B will have produced roughly 244,900 kilowatt hours. So already a difference of 8,100 kilowatt hours. But if we extend this out to year 40, the gap becomes even more dramatic. By year 40, system A will have generated roughly 319,100 kilowatt hours, while system B will have produced roughly 371,800 kilowatt hours. So that's a staggering 52,700 kilowatt hours more than system A. And remember, these systems were identical in every single way. The only difference was a mere 0.362% in their annual degradation rates. Now, I understand it's kind of hard to conceptualize what those numbers actually mean. So let's put that extra energy into perspective in terms of savings over time. Because again, that's our primary goal when going solar, to save money by producing electricity from our panels we own, rather than buying power from the utility company at whatever gouging rates they choose to charge. If electricity costs 20 cents per kilowatt hour, then an additional 52,700 kilowatt hours a year could translate to over $10,540 in savings. So that's a massive difference just from choosing a panel with a lower degradation. But at this point, you might be saying, well, Jack, obviously solar panel system B will be way more expensive. And yeah, that's a fair assumption. But here's the thing. Choosing a tier one high quality solar panel typically costs about 30 to 40 cents price per watt more than a lower tier panel with a higher degradation. But as we just saw, the additional energy production from a better quality panel 
can easily offset that cost in a relatively short period of time. And from that point forward, it's all extra savings. So here's the bottom line. If you're investing into a solar panel for the long haul, low degradation is one of the most important factors to consider. A tiny difference in the degradation rate might not seem like a big deal at first, but over 20 or 30 years, it can mean tens of thousands of extra kilowatt hours in production and many thousands of dollars in savings. That's why when comparing solar panel system quotes, I really encourage homeowners not just to move forward with the system which has the lowest bid. With other home purchases, that reasoning could make sense, but really when it comes to picking out solar, our goal should be to design a system that maximizes our financial savings over a very long period of time, not just to install the cheapest system that you can find on day one, which will perform poorly over its lifespan. One thing that solar panel warranties do not cover, contrary to what some companies may tell you, is damage caused from natural disasters such as wind and hail. Many people I speak to in places like Florida and Texas have concerns about their systems being damaged during natural disasters, and what I can tell you is that these panels are fairly resilient to strong winds and heavy rains. However, they can be very vulnerable when it comes to damage from thick debris hitting the glass. So, for example, in places like Dallas, which can experience tennis ball sized hailstorms and present a significant risk for panels. If you're worried about this, you do actually have the option to roll your solar panel system into your homeowner's insurance policy. Depending upon where you live, this might only increase your premium by 20 to $40 per month, but it could be a small price to pay for the peace of mind when it comes to protecting your investment. Now, one of the biggest issues that I find residential solar customers are facing in 2025 and something that nobody is really talking about are installation companies selling inverter systems that cannot fully handle handle all of the power that homeowners panels are producing. This in fact reduces the amount of energy that homeowners can get from their panels and is a very common thing that I'm seeing when homeowners show me their proposals. You see, inverters are a crucial component of any residential solar installation because solar panels produce electricity and direct current while their homes are wired and alternating current. Therefore, a conversion of DC to AC needs to take place, which the inverter handles. Inverters come in all different sizes and it's essential that the inverter is properly sized in order to handle the solar panels or the string's overall output to avoid any limitations. Though an inverter also has a maximum power rating. So for example, a five kilowatt hour inverter can handle up to 5,000 watts. If the solar panels produce more than this, the inverters cannot process the excess DC power and clips the extra electricity. And this can create a worst case scenario for homeowners because for instance, on a sunny afternoon when panels are producing at high levels, the production could get capped off, essentially stunting the solar panel system's output. And that's definitely not ideal. And I see this issue especially being common with microinverter systems. Often homeowners are considering larger water solar panels, but the solar consultant or installation company isn't aware of the concept of clipping and sells homeowners microinverters that are severely undersized for their panels. For example, if you're looking at a solar panel in the 415 watt to 430 watt range, which is becoming a very popular size, you'll want a microinverter inverter like the Enphase IQ8A, which is properly sized for those panels. If your solar company is quoting you a microinverter like the Enphase IQ8 Plus or even the IQ8M for that matter, that should raise red flags about the installer and what other corners they may be cutting on your solar system. Now, this video will give you a fair idea as far as what to look for when judging various solar panel options for your home. But if you'd actually like to see me rank, in my opinion, the top five best solar panel options for homeowners in 2025 and explain which panel could be best for homeowners in each different scenario, make sure you check out my video going to the top five best solar panels in 2025, which will pop up on the screen now. But as always, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see y'all next time.